have a body of law. We have, we have natural law, we have positive law, we have moral law that seems very solid, but it's built on a very, very fragile base of indeterminacy. And the indeterminacy comes into play when we ultimately don't have an idea what proportionality is. We have to rely on some kind of gut feeling. Where we don't have an idea what moderate risk is, we have to rely on some kind of consensus or gut feeling. And this isn't the only instance in the laws of armed conflict or military ethics where we see this. The whole idea of superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering, if you get down to it, is wholly indeterminate. There are no definitions of suffering. There are no definitions of superfluous other in the sense of maybe not necessary, but there's also an element of unnecessary suffering that means inhuman suffering. And if you try to pin somebody down and say, what is inhuman suffering, then you get all kinds of, 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 uh, of answers. And I once talked about this with someone, and they said that in the international instruments that are translated into pigeon, inhuman suffering is translated as that which, you, that which you wouldn't do to a dog. And I tried to find this, but I realized I couldn't read pigeon. So. Uh, and that may or not be true, but the idea is that it, it's, it's based on some kind of intuitive base that's, that's very, very indeterminate. Uh, the same idea of unlawful, of manifestly unlawful orders, and the idea of a black moral flag that's waving over these orders. Ultimately, it comes down to some kind of judgment call. So this entire pyramid of what we call military ethics and the law of armed conflict is in a way very indeterminate. So these are the kinds of answers that I would give, and now the question of warnings. Well, you see there that I think warnings are something of a red herring. That's a red herring up there in the right-hand corner. <laughs> <laughs> Why are warnings a red herring? Well, before saying that, they're not entirely a red herring. They're not entirely a red herring because conceivably you would have a situation where if enough people fled, the number of people in danger would fall. So an attack that was once disproportionate would now become proportionate. Now that creates a paradox, maybe the kind that Alan mentioned earlier, that if, if, a, if a group could coordinate itself well enough, they would say, well, we're not going to flee, we're going to keep the attack disproportionate, so either the other side won't attack, uh, or if they do, we're going to reap all these benefits of, of this, the so-called CNN effect. And if that makes sense, and it's a coordination problem, then it may, may also might make sense, and it would be <coughs> rational for guerrillas to prevent them from escaping. It's a different problem. Actually, we talked about that a few days ago. But proportionality can be affected by warnings. But that wasn't quite what the questionnaire had in mind. He had in mind something a little bit more, a little bit more expansive than that. And his argument was, I think, that if you give a warning to someone, doesn't that inculpate civilians? Don't they, doesn't it let the attacker off the hook? Doesn't it shift responsibility? Because these people were told to leave and they didn't leave, or they left and they came back. Now, doesn't that somehow make them human shields? Doesn't it somehow raise the bar on collateral damage, discount, as we talked about yesterday, their lives? And the example that I'm sometimes given is that in the southern part of Israel, in the desert, there's a, there's, much of the desert areas used as, as firing ranges by the military. So as you drive along through the desert, there's these big signs that say, do not enter, firing range. So they say, well, that's what we're doing. If you go into a firing range and you get killed, well, that's your problem. It's not our problem. And I thought about this for a while, and I said, you know, this might make some sense. And so I realized, that's me. It's me because in 1991, in 2006, I live in Haifa. I picked up and I left. And after a few days, I came back. So I picked up my family, fled the north, fled to the south for a little while, got sick of people I was staying with, and said, hell with it. We're going back home. <laughs> now, that experience leads me to say two things about fleeing and about this whole issue of warnings. Here I'm going to lose some objective distance. First of all, fleeing is very difficult. It's not difficult because we're old and we're infirmed and we're sick and the roads were bad. The roads were good, there was a car in the garage, there was a full tank of gas, we could have gone anytime we wanted to. The problem with fleeing is that people are very reluctant to flee. First of all, it's very difficult to evaluate the kind of danger you're in under conditions of uncertainty. Haifa wasn't being subject to carpet bombing. There weren't buildings blowing up on every street corner. But there were air raid sirens every half hour, every 45 minutes. And you can hear the thuds of Scud missiles dropping in this neighborhood or that neighborhood. But still, you say, well, maybe I'll stay a little longer. Maybe I'll stay a little bit longer. You become very defiant. You think that leaving is a sign of surrender. It's a sign of cowardice. It becomes logistically difficult to leave. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do with the dog? Now, <coughs> that might sound trivial, <coughs> but we couldn't leave until we found a place to board the dog. Other people just turned their animals loose. This happened to be a big problem after the war. 
Uh, it turns out that the kennel that we use is to the north, which was the wrong direction to go. So eventually got on the phone, found a kennel who offered discount rates to refugees from Haifa. <laughs> and we were able to, able to board the dog, and we took off. But I came back. We packed off, actually, we packed off the kids to my father who lives in Chicago, which is a rational act. And my wife and I went back to the house. And I would have to say that in spite of the conversations we had earlier about becoming a human shield, not becoming a human shield, having, being, discounting the value of civilian in certain situations, I would be deeply offended if someone said that my right to non-combatant immunity had been compromised. I did nothing but go home. And I, and again, I'm trying to relate to some of the conversations we had. I can't see how I became a human shield, even though it turns out that on the building not far from me, there was a tall building that had a little, maybe a big antenna and a small military base. Uh, I can't see that I became a human shield. I can't say that I voluntarily gave up my rights to protection. I can't say that if Nasrallah had said, well, we should discount Gross's life because he left and he came back, that that makes any sense at all. So in the final analysis, I would have to conclude that even though these rights conflict, rights of combatants and the rights of non-combatants and so forth, the rights of non-combatants prevail. I, as a non-combatant, have no duty to assume the risk of warfare, and soldiers then must assume a moderate risk. Now, having said that, people say to me, well, what if parents ask you? Now, parents, the word parents in Hebrew doesn't necessarily mean a person with children. It means a person with children who have been, will be, or are in the army, at least in most cases. So the question is, is parents are going to say, don't do that. Don't risk our children's lives to protect non-combatants. And the answer to that question is simple. Don't ask the parents. And you don't ask the parents, because I, as a parent, would have given the same answer. You don't ask the parents, you ask the soldiers. And I think Michael Walter mentioned this yesterday. The soldiers are going to give you very honest and very honorable answers. They're not going to want to put civilians at unnecessary risk, and they are willing to risk their lives for non-combatants. The problem comes in, at least in Israel, is what exactly is a non-combatant. Because if you think that that non-combatant is not really a non-combatant, but somehow liable, then you're going to say, well, if he's not, if he's not a non-combatant and he's liable, then I really don't have to risk my life for him. And there is a sense which many Israelis, I see it among my students all the time, find it very difficult to attach innocence to Palestinians in general, because they're all supporting the terrorists, or partially supporting the terrorists, or participating, or putting bombs in their garages, or transporting weapons, and so on and so forth. But if you can get them, and this is an educational problem more than anything else, a problem of social discourse, if you can get them to understand and realize, and some do, of course, that there are truly non-innocent non-combatants on the other side, then I think they're going to act as they should. Thank you very much. Wow. Good. Thank you. Next is uh, Michael Skirker. Assistant Professor in Leadership Ethics and Law here at the Naval Academy. He has a PhD in Ethics from University of Chicago Divinity School. And before joining the Naval Academy faculty, he taught at the University of Chicago and DePaul University in Chicago. His academic interests are broad, include professional ethics, just war theory, moral pluralism, theological ethics, and religion and politics. His publications include articles on ethics and asymmetric war, Moral Pluralism and Intelligence Ethics, and his book, An Ethics of Interrogation, was released by University of Chicago Press in 2010. Thank you, Mike, <coughs> for doing this. Thank you. Thank you to all of the organizers of this wonderful conference. In November of 2009, Senator Lindsey Graham grilled Attorney General Eric Holder over the question of whether a captured bin Laden would have to be Mirandized given the administration's interest in providing al-Qaeda detainees access to the federal courts. I wanted to consider today, from a philosophical perspective, without hyperventilation, what's at stake in affording due process rights to suspected al-Qaeda members. To be clear, unless otherwise noted, the normative language I use will be moral rather than legal. My positions here are derived from arguments I make in my book in Ethics of Interrogation. It's important to clarify some preliminary matters of fact. It's claimed by some that foreign terrorists don't deserve due process protections. This argument conflates punishments with legal procedures aimed at determining criminal culpability. If punishment is appropriate, 
it's handled by different actors and institutions than those potentially interrogating and trying a suspect. Further, as a matter of fact, the U.S. routinely affords due process protections to people suspected of most heinous crimes, both citizens and foreigners, whether they are captured domestically or if they are captured abroad. The type of alleged crime does not offer salient distinctions here either. Crimes addressed in the U.S. courts include, of course, crimes directed at private citizens, crimes seeking to corrupt the functioning of government, and cases of domestic terrorism meant to overthrow the U.S. government. While the 9-11 attacks have been termed acts of war by some, this term doesn't have a legal definition. True, bin Laden and al Zawahiri declared war against the U.S. in a 1998 fatwa, but so what? A war is not what's happening because a couple guys say so. Due process, we need to remember, is for the benefit of the innocent as well as those suspected of crimes. It's tempting to say that terrorists don't deserve these protections, yet no one wants a government that renders people guilty by fiat, hauling them off to gulags or delivering summary executions in prison basements. States are forced to develop competent investigation and prosecution services when asked to, quote, shoulder the entire load of pr proving a person's guilt. So provisions, states are more likely to find and convict actually guilty parties. It can't be overemphasized that those whom the government has in its power are not terrorists, but suspected terrorists. For every confirmed bin Laden or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, there are a host of people in the wrong time, the wrong place, when special operators kick in the door. Preliminaries now addressed, we need to address two key questions. First, what moral or civil rights do Al-Qaeda suspects enjoy? Rights form an initial boundary on a, any kind of state's behavior. Second, what are the state's aims and its interactions with such suspects? I'm going to discuss now criminal suspects' rights and then POW rights in order to consider if either are adequate for Al-Qaeda suspects. The ambiguity of criminal suspects' culpability grounds the rights states properly afford them in the criminal justice arena. States properly defer to criminal suspects' right to silence in recognition of the possibility that they are innocent. If a suspect really is guilty, he does not have a moral right to keep criminal secrets from others. Were he to present flagrant evidence of wrongdoing, say bragging to somebody about stolen loot, others could demand to know his criminal secrets. But in most cases, investigators do not know a suspect has forfeited his moral rights to privacy and silence by plotting or committing a crime. And their possible subjective certainty does not overcome their objective fallibility. The fallibility of state agents coupled with the baseline deference toward inhabitants' autonomy, liberal states properly observe, entails that such states cannot summarily suspend suspects' rights. Appearing suspicious should not involve the forfeiture of any rights since being considered suspicious is a subjective assessment on the part of investigators and does not necessarily entail any true forfeiture on the suspicious person's part. State agents are obliged to protect inhabitants' rights by investigating and preventing crimes. So they are in the somewhat paradoxical predicament of being unable to protect people's rights without material infringing on people's rights. This by accosting suspects, asking them personal questions, and perhaps by arresting them. <clears throat> this behavior is consistent with inhabitants' rights over the long term since providing a relatively crime-free environment is a precondition for inhabitants enjoying and expressing the full extent of their possible rights. Police act in a way consistent with what the state has caused to know about a suspect by respecting as many of his baseline rights as possible, including a right to silence, as is consistent with competent crime investigation. Police can still defer to suspects' privacy and autonomy even while physically detaining them by accepting suspects' refusal to cooperate without threatening them or levying punishments. They are mentally free even while physically detained. 
An admonition about a right to silence, such as given in the Miranda warning or the Article 31 Bravo warning in US military law, is a way of the government telling us something.